nice looking park. And uh, what I can do is click on the little tool that I just found in, in Google Earth yesterday. If I come back in time, this is 2014 when it was just a, an average yard here. Um, if I come back to 2014, 2015, this is July, this is shortly before the um, explosion, which is, I think it was in August. It must have been a cloudy day or something that day. And this is uh, 22nd of August, the, the explosion was on the 12th of August, I think it was. Um, you can get an idea here, so this is shortly before anyone got in and, and censored photos and changed anything. Um, the photos were captured on satellites and preserved there. You get an idea here the size of the crater and all of this debris around here. Th these are the likes of 40 foot containers that you can see. And so you get a little bit of a scale, an idea of the scale around this area. Um, it was, it was a, a very, very big disaster. In this area, um, what's that going to do? No. Let's see if I can turn that off. The other thing that I, I'll just point out quickly, um, what have I got there, the 3rd of October. Actually, you can see here how quickly that image changed between August and October. Um, I was there in, in that sort of first week, and when I was driving around some of these roads, not immediately after, but about 10 days and, and a few weeks later, um, this was still barricaded off. The Chinese had put big containers, like a wall of containers. You couldn't see anything there at all because they, they were trying to hide everything. After about three weeks, there was a row of brand new trees all the way down there, and not more than a little bit later on, a place was starting that looked like a park. Um, but what was also interesting is, if you look where this um, explosion centre is here, um, there's a stadium just over here that we also drove past on just about every day. And that, that stadium was about a kilometre away, but it was smashed to pieces. It had to be demolished and rebuilt. Even though it was that far away from that explosion. Uh, there's a, it's just here, brand new railway station. Um, in the very early days, I was able to come down the street from the other side because they hadn't blocked that off. Um, when we're doing, trying to get in as close as we could uh, with some good PPE, I can add, um, just to get an idea of what was going on there. That brand new train station there was also just completely smashed apart. Um, that would have also had to have been demolished and rebuilt. And just about anything uh, within range of about where the stadium was, um, so that you get an idea, all, all of these buildings out to about this kind of a radius here um, would have all have had to have been demolished and rebuilt. And even beyond that, there's quite significant structural damage. Okay, after that. Didn't it register on the um, Richter scale or something? Yes, it did. To, I'll, I'll come to that. Oh, okay. yeah. Um, but on, on this site, um, just to give you an idea of what kind of things were there, that there was reported that there was 800,000 kilos of ammonium nitrate. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot. 500,000 kilos of potassium nitrate. Um, and so there was some pretty significant volumes of that. And that's not necessarily what they were allowed to have, but that's what was understood to be present at that site. Um, they had no permit to store at that material at all, actually. Um, and in total, we, we understand there's around about 1.3 to 1.6 billion dollars US of insurance claims um, that arose from that explosion. But what's also noted, um, important to note about that is in, uh, in China, generally the level of insurance is pretty low, and so that wouldn't have been a, a you know, only a, a less than a half of all of the properties there are insured, so that you can double that damage. And the companies that are insured are underinsured, a lot of them. And they also um, they they don't you know, they don't have the same level of rebuild value. And so when you have a look, say a billion dollars worth of damage there, if that was in Australia, I think it's uh, it's probably four to five uh, 
billion dollars to do the same type of thing. Everything's cheaper in China, including the rework that they do over there. Um, personal injury cover, because there were a lot of people injured in this explosion, so people in standing in apartments and being entertained by the explosions, and you heard some of that. Some of the ones that are a little bit closer to that, some of them were very close. Uh, when the explosions happened, and, uh, before they could really think about what was going on, they had shards of glass going through them as well. So a lot of people die, um, and the way the Chinese government works, they were compensated $3,000. That's as, about as good as their life insurance can get. People that were seriously injured were compensated for $2,000, uh, most people were less than $500 if they had to go to the in hospital to get some foot glass taken out or some other you know, issue like that. So although the insurance numbers are pretty, pretty big, um, actually the value and the extent of the damage there is really, far, far greater than what you can initially imagine. Um, yeah, generally, I will move on. another picture gives you a bit of an idea before they start to clean up uh, while the place is still smoking where some of these 40 foot containers uh, have been thrown around some of them up into the sky and landed back down and some of them went sideways uh, so that's a week after the event no this is this is I think probably within 24 48 oh, hours. Okay. yeah pretty soon after this is a lot of the photos here are not mine oh, most okay. of them uh, mine are too detailed and whatever it was that we were inspecting so so what I, what I thought I would do is um, just superimpose on Sydney. Um, now this, this is a 10 kilometer radius out from a dangerous goods store in Sydney at the ports area. And this, uh, this line here would be a sort of a radius that you could say anyone within that radius would be saying, what the fuck was that? You know, it would be such a loud explosion. It would just stop everyone in their tracks. In the Tianjin area, Tianjin city itself was just 40 kilometres away from where the explosion had. People in Tianjin heard the explosion and they also told me they were stopped in that tracks. So, what was that? 40 kilometres away. So you can imagine in Sydney, there's 10 kilometres. Um, it would pretty well capture it. everybody in the city would be thinking, what's going on there? <clears throat> so then I'll put some more, this zoomed in a little bit, um, just put some extra lines on here. Um, and this is also around an own dangerous goods store in Sydney. And there you can see, um, I think it's one, uh, two, three, and five kilometer radiuses that you could say that pretty well everything in that first kilometer radius there would be destroyed, everything would be gone. Um, you'd have to knock it down or rebuild it or something like that. And as you get further out, the damage becomes a little bit less and a little bit less. But one of the things that I think would be interesting to note is that you could say that airport and the ports of Sydney would be uh, out of action for at least a couple of months. The runways would be not flat anymore. Um, the ports and the, and the, the uh, jetties and everything else like that, they just wouldn't be able to operate them. The cranes would be off the rails, and things like that, that kind of damage. So if this was to occur in that kind of an area in Sydney, um, and I don't think they had the same, the same sort of volumes of um, those explosive materials and toxic materials there, but if it did, um, it would just knock Sydney flat for, for a couple of months at least, not to mention all of the other damage there. Um, it would be a very, very major event in, in any city, actually. So there were 129 types of chemical substances um, that were in that uh, area where the explosions occurred and leaked. 50% um, of the total weight of those comprised the sodium hydroxide, potassium, uh, nitrate, ammonium nitrate, sodium cyanide, there was 680,000 kilos of sodium cyanide, uh, magnesium and sodium sulfide. And of that sodium cyanide, um, around about a half, 321,000 kilos was never recovered. Uh, there's some drone footage there, um, but just on those stats about how, who died, there were 165 people that um, were at least admitted killed by that incident. But of, of that, um, were 99 firefighters that were sort of close enough in that they were attempting to put out some of the fires. So early on in the evening, um, there were some fires burning um, and the fires were spreading and getting bigger. There were some small explosions. There was an LPG gas station there that caught fire and, and the LPG tanks, you know, storage tanks there were on fire. So the fire brigades were moving in around some of these places. Um, every, every 
person and piece of equipment and appliance that they could find from as far away as could get there who were fighting this fire. Um, but as you can see from those explosions, if you were anywhere near any of that, that was it. Uh, you know, they were, they were killed instantly during those times. So 165 people, 99 firefighters, 11 police rescue officers, um, another, another 800 people were hospitalised as well. So when you say 165 dead, that includes the firefighters yes. or plus? Includes. Because oh. actually this is an industrial area. Oh, okay. Um, and, and normally there's nobody there at all yeah, okay. overnight because this was um, just about midnight on the 12th of August. So normally there should be nobody there at okay. all, but because they were fighting fires, it was predominantly firefighters. Do you know the actual like, number of firefighters who attended? No. Okay. There were also quite a lot of vehicles um, damaged in the fire. Um, apparently, uh, there's something like in the order of about 760, uh, sorry, 7,641 new imported vehicles were destroyed. And another That's a lot of invoices four, in there, Bobby. Where is he? <laughs> <laughs> and another 4,700 um, uh, company vehicles or private, or, you know, government vehicles uh, destroyed as well. So this is a quite a big range of different types of vehicles destroyed. Don't know about privately owned vehicles, um, and although China traditionally doesn't have a lot of private vehicle ownership, actually that's changing a lot. The, the, they've got some very big modern roads now, and they're all chock a block full of vehicles. Um, so there would have been another 5,000 or, or something like that vehicles, I'm sure. Um, so the fires first reported at that area, um, you're sort of around getting up towards midnight, 22:52, um, and then a range of explosions with the last explosion there, um, 2334. Uh, reportedly 68 uh, tons of sodium cyanide there, um, 42 times what they were supposed to have or allowed to store there according to their permits. <coughs> the, um, they did register on the Richter scale that the first smaller explosion there was registered 2.3 on the Richter scale and, and the second one um, you get an idea from the from the videos that you saw before it registered 2.9 but remembering that that Richter scale is logarithmic and so it jumped from sort of uh, if it was from 2 to 3 that would be a, a factor of 10 times greater so it wasn't it wasn't from 2 to 3 but it was a much much more significant uh, blast very very significant so we uh, myself and my colleague Marco uh, we, we arrived there five days after this and as I mentioned before, our, our duty was initially to go to um, all of the perimeter sites that our insurers were um, insuring, the, the sites that were belonging to their clients, and to essentially the first order of business was to find out was there any of the sodium cyanide around that everyone was talking about and concerned about. Um, that was it. When going into the country like China, is it hard to get for example, like a visa, just to, uh, just to I, rock up I go and there often enough that I have an APEC card, so oh, I can okay. just go, I don't need a return ticket or anything else, I just get on the plane and go. Right. Um, you can go to Shanghai for, I think it's three days on a visa, but you're not allowed to do any work or, or any um, commercial work or business or anything else. Um, but to get a visa otherwise takes about 48 hours. You can go through Hong Kong and get it in about 12, uh, but with an APEC card you can just go straight away. But once you're in driving around, is is there a security problem in terms of and, and police this, saying, what are you doing? And not, not really, but in this environment, there is more so. Yeah, especially mm. if you're a foreigner, um, people yeah. will want to stop you or they'll want to check you anyway of what you're doing. Um, especially if you look like a Greenpeace person, if you look like a reporter, <laughs> then you're in real trouble. But did, is, is your... Um, your duties in terms of what you're trying to do is that enough to get you close or do they, yes. they just they let you not nah, you're not no, well we no one gets clearance to come in this far close and towards the blast here um, you know sort of this the whole block of streets around that were a no-go zone for anyone in the beginning um, we were there looking at the insured sites so we were traveling with our insurance loss adjusters um, in a taxi we'd go straight to that site oh. it's far enough away from the blast that there's no police or army or anyone else there so we could go into the premises and around and do all of our investigation and inspections and, and you know, um, swab samples and other things for cyanide and that, uh, and then we move on again. Um, and then as we, after the first couple of days, we were wondering, you know, couldn't find anything. So we went close as we possibly could, and, and I mentioned before, I got right in behind that train station that was smashed up, um, and I was just looking at 
anything I could find on the side of the street and some guard houses and other things to see if there's anything there as well. How are you doing your analysis? Do you have a um, I'll come to that, how we, how we did that testing. Were, can I, were you aware of the, the above the storage cap capacity before you got there? No. So that you found that those that, figures are? That all evolved probably a good 12 months, 24 months after you know, the whole story about that. And what about PPE did you do for yourself? Uh, in the beginning we started off with like sewer suits uh, and it was hot, like 40 degrees. And when we continually found nothing, then we came back down to lower and lower levels of PPE. And a good sign was there were no dead bodies on the street. So that was a good sign. If there was a lot of cyanide around, there'd be some dead bodies as well, but there weren't. Um, eventually we dropped back all the way to nothing. Uh, there were a couple of people that persevered with scuba suits. Um, they would be entering a site with a scuba suit and all kinds of things like that, but there'd be people walking around the street all around and not falling over. So, yeah. so do you feel personally safe from your experiences there before hand in country? Uh, well, I've been to China a lot of times. Yep. So from that point of view, no problem at all. Um, and I've also been to some pretty marginal sites um, after all kinds of different incidents as well. So I've, I've grown wary of, of different types of things that can happen and go on. And this kind of the misinformation, um, yeah, I'm used to that part of it as well. So I sort of don't trust anyone, uh, anything that people tell you. you. You test your own self and take your own information like that. But you do have to be very, very cautious and careful. Um, yeah, that Tengu port area is a large hub for the auto industry. Um, about a dozen different foreign auto makers um, have their cars. As I mentioned before, the Chinese economy had taken a dive in about the 12 months beforehand, so every spare piece of land there had a, had a brand new vehicle sitting on it, and they were all top-end vehicles as well, with every option you can imagine. So Jaguars and Porsche, all these types of things. Um, but a lot of them look like that after the fire. And what you can see here, even though that's a little bit away from the blast zone, if you look at every 40 foot container in the background, it looks like a truck drove into it. And that's just from the impact of the blast wave or shock wave. It's kind of like a sound wave, just hitting it with enough force that it could cave in the side of the container. Um, the, the, the vehicles burning here, um, a lot of those vehicles caught fire from something getting thrown up into the sky and then falling back down on, on the vehicle. So somewhere in there you'll find a squashed vehicle um, and the vehicle catching, <coughs> catching fire and the fire jumping across from one vehicle to the next. Um, yeah, many different types of uh, vehicles had thermal damage there. Um, yeah, we were involved in the Fiat Chrysler, Jeep, and Jaguar, Land Rover, and Porsche, and others, <laughs> Tesla. Um, every, every vehicle you can possibly imagine was involved. Uh, what, what is interesting in this photo here, I thought, is that you can see everything here is burnt to the ground, some were burnt worse than this, but in any case, burnt to the ground. When you come around the corner here, um, these ones are not burnt at all. And between the two vehicles in that area there, there's a, there's a space. And this was a, a sort of a really good graphic example of how fire break works when it comes to vehicles, you know, big car, uh, car parking lot. Um, and we saw that in a lot of different places where there'd be acres of burnt cars, <coughs> and then there'd be a, a, an empty road there with this you know, sort of a driveway through spot. All of the vehicles on the other side weren't burnt at all. Uh, yeah, further back they're burnt as well. That that may have jumped over there, or it might have been something else falling down in that area. I didn't burn vehicles. If they're burnt, you don't need to look at them any closer. On the previous slide, all the containers looks like they were being dumped. Were what the contents of them, or the contents of them as well? On the previous slide, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, don't know. Um, what I do know is that when, when something hit the side wall of something, um, that shock wave will pretty well pass through it the same as the sound wave will pass through a wall, so it'll be attenuated a bit. Um, but it's so much energy, you can imagine if it caused the side of a container to go in like that, anything on the inside was subject to what was left over, yeah. maybe 1%, 2% or something like that, probably still destroyed. Um, so this is a, what is it, just a warehouse anyway. Um, what, it, what it shows really, I guess, um, the impact damage to the, some of the structures here. 
Uh, you can see over this side here, this looks like it's been exposed to um, pressure waves or shock waves and it, it smashed and all of that. And what I can say on the inside of that building, even though that particular building is not a great example because nearly every external cladding has been blown right off, um, this is a, about a kilometre and a half away. Um, but on the inside of that building, if there's some partitions, what we also found is the shock wave went through the outside, through the middle of the building, hit some of the insert, internal partitions, and the internal partitions would also bounce sideways about 300 millimetres, something like that. Now, if those partitions were bolted to a pillar holding up the roof, the whole pillar, and a big row of pillars, um, they would also just get shifted over about 300 mil. And some of those were not particularly well bolted to the ground or the top, and so the walls would just shift across. If you walk through the building and everything would look quite normal, but if you looked up, you would see that the, the wall was there, and the wall had moved over a little bit, but it wasn't in the right place anymore. It was 30 centimetres across from where it used to be. So there's some odd things like that went on. Uh, actually, not at this explosion, but at another explosion in Taiwan some years before, I saw a, a CCTV at a power station that um, they burned refuse to generate power in, in Kaohsiung in Taiwan, but it was an interesting thing that someone delivered a truckload of defective uh, fireworks that accidentally got put into the furnace and put it up at the power station. But on the CCTV, there's a, uh, a big, big shutter door, and on the CCTV, you can see this whole shutter door getting blasted off its hinges, go up, and you know, sort of rotate around as it got blasted off. But then as the explosion shockwave went the other way, it got sucked back in again. And so when people went there in the morning, the door was there, but it was inside out. <laughs> no one knew how did that happen mm -hmm. until you looked at the CCTV, but the whole door went off, put them back in again. It was quite unique. Um, what we found is, you know, sort of a uh, common theme on all buildings that uh, throughout this whole city, and this is around about four kilometres away. Um, if there's a, uh, a, a, a sort of a flat panel, uh, depending on the strength of the panel, so glass wasn't particularly good, um, and it was faced on to the shock waves, it would be pretty well destroyed. Other walls, strong walls, like the concrete structure there on the, on the right hand side, um, they would survive. If you went around the corner where the windows are, um, more of a perpendicular angle, angle to, the, to the shock waves, um, they would survive a whole lot better. So different materials and different angles, and sometimes it depended on other buildings in front sheltering what's behind. So if there were a row of apartment buildings, um, sometimes that would provide enough shelter to attenuate the blast waves coming through. The final report, um, we were involved in uh, assessing or, or, or uh, uh, investigating the cause of this explosion. Um, the Chinese would never have allowed that, of course. Um, but the fi uh, final report by the Chinese was released on February the 5th, 2016. Um, and that, that document's available if you're interested. It's 170 pages in Chinese. Um, we did have it translated. But, um, I, have, I haven't got it on here, don't worry about it. Um, yeah, so the Chinese government formed an investigation. They released a very detailed report. Um, they're the only people that we, we know of that, that looked at the actual causation and came up with some reasons why. Um, and they did a pretty good detailed job of that. Um, in the beginning, no one else was even allowed closer than about 500 meters to that site. And at the end of their few weeks, or about 10 days after the explosion, they'd already start to fill in the hole, plant the trees, and move things around. So it was varying the evidence, if you like. But they did a lot of work beyond that um, after they had inspected that site. Um, they had a lot of uh, citations in their report, um, so they didn't refer to NFPA or any of the standards that you might be familiar with there, um, but they have a lot of their own Chinese standards, which are probably somewhat similar or, or even borrowed or stolen um, from NFPA. And they seem to follow the same kind of patterns, and um, so they, they did a fairly thorough report, and, and I'll come to what they down at the moment. So um, one of the things they found there um, is multiple um, types of explosive or, or solid fuels there. One of them was um, nitrocellulose, 32 or nearly 33 tonnes of nitrocellulose and liquor, uh, sorry lacquer, not liquor, <laughs> lacquer, um, had arrived at the arrivals part of that port area that same day. And I don't know if you know about the nitrocellulose, but it's, um, it's a kind of a unique property. It's also called gunpowder, uh, sorry, gun, um, cotton, gun cotton. And 
it's a um, flammable, combustible, self-heating material. Um, when it is transported, it's often bagged up with water or ethanol so that it, um, the amount of heating is, is contained or controlled. Um, and if you lose that wetting agent and it dries out, then it will um, be able to self-heat and, um, and then deteriorate and, and you know, something bad's gonna happen after that. So um, there's a couple of numbers here. At a, at a temperature of around 40 degrees, it'll decompose pretty rapidly um, and it will actually um, catch fire and burn you know, very, very fast. And of course, if it's just a little loose piece, like the previous slide, it, it'll just go off with a bit of a flash and that's about it and not much more will happen than that. Um, so it's a, it's a self-heating issue there. And I think I'll go to the next slide. I'm sure all of you will be familiar with some self-heating issues. It's a pretty, pretty uh, reactive material there on the, on the diamond that's 233, so that's something to be concerned about if you're going into that type of a zone. That's the formula for it, and so you get an idea from what's inside it, um, what properties it might have. Um, so it's it's also known as the as the um, um, uh, flash cotton or gun cotton, and it's highly flammable, self-heating. Um, it's extremely fast burning. Yes, very fast burning. It's what a lot of magicians use it for. You know, they have right. it in their hand and mm -hmm. a big puff of smoke and flame, but it's so fast um, it won't burn you or something like it's that. Not a huge heat. Yes, um, and it's, it's a base for cellulite film, which is a non biofringence type film, which is something that I was interested in when I was doing 3D, I used to develop 3D display systems at one time. Um, photographic film, so Kodak used to manufacture a lot of this in the US, um, the celluloid that is, uh, and it's a base for coatings for the likes of, um, it's in cosmetics, and they used to even manufacture billiard balls from this as well. It's stored in bags, um, so normally in plastic bags, and if it's not properly sealed up, um, then that's going to, it's going to dry out and the self-heating can um, run away more quickly or run away at all. So um, in order to prevent runaway, they, they do seal it up in a bag with water out ethanol. Um, and what experimental findings found, uh, the, the Chinese did a lot of experimental findings with this. Um, if it's in an unsealed bag, um, in around two hours, uh, if the ambient temperature is 50 degrees, it, it will self-heat to a point where it will actually um, catch fire and, and take off. So on the day of the explosion, at outdoor temperatures, and I know this from some weeks later, it was damn hot, um, but on that day it was 36 degrees. And um, But if you've ever been inside a 40-foot container when it's that hot outside, you can imagine on the inside of a container, um, they, they worked out that it could get up to around about 65 degrees. Um, and so they had several, quite a lot of containers um, of this material there. And they also said that uh, the, these bags of um, nitrocellulose weren't always that well sealed. So sometimes when they throw them in, a lot of times they manually load these things, the bags will pop open, they'll leak if the water comes out. Um, that's in this very, very hot container. And this is uh, the findings of the Chinese uh, fire investigators that this was where everything initiated from is the very, very high quantity of poorly packed uh, hydrocellulose. They did some experiment burn, uh, experimental burns here. Um, on that right hand side is 40 kilos of, of that material under a test combustion burn. And on the left hand side is, uh, is, is one of the burns that occurred or was recorded during the um, explosions or prior to the explosions. Um, the nitrocellulose didn't cause the explosions, it started off the fires that later led to the explosions. But what's interesting here is that yeah, you can see the sort of shape and size of the plumes of the fire are very, very comparable. So the first explosion, 2334, um, this was an ammonium nitrate explosion. So ammonium nitrate seems to take quite a lot of heating over a period of time from a decent fire before it explodes. Um, but there were two lots of that exploded. Um, and these are some of the uh, compounds that were present during those explosions in, in the warehouse where these explosions occurred. Ammonium nitrate, I guess you're familiar with or heard of it, um, very highly explosive uh, material. There's been some quite bad explosions in Australia as well from an ammonium nitrate. Um, seems to 
there seem to be a good number of explosions around the world at different times from storage, um, even even from agricultural units where people have packed them a lot around trees and an orchard, uh, then they can have some explosions there um, inadvertently as well. And I was talking with the EPA um, just today about uh, ammonium nitrate uh, because a lot of it is actually um, manufactured in Newcastle, and there's three main manufacturers that run it out as a, as a prill, a pill, okay. uh, as an emulsion, and as a ammonium nitrate like solution. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so we've, um, we're talking with the EPA there on from the hazmat unit. Okay. okay. And um, we were also talking about Charlie, which was, of course, ammonium nitrate uh, powder that um, exploded, fertilizer exploded in Queensland, and that reached to 2.1 on the Richter scale. Wow. That was yeah. a semi trial. That's right, yeah. Yeah, so it's that was. Sober, it's a very sober compound. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's great fertilizer. Or if you heat it up long enough as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Do you know where they got the information as to the first explosion being caused specifically by that? Or that is the guess basically? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't think it's a, I think it's uh, as best guess or you know, best um, information that they could put together. Um, now we even, we didn't try to analyze it or critique it or anything else like that, but that was their conclusion that so, uh, nitrocellulose initiated all of the rest of the fires that started, because there were a lot of fires uh, spread around for several hundred metres initially, um, and, but with a decent enough fire going, like an LPG tank of um, burn, for instance, with uh, ammonium nitrate uh, nearby uh, for a good length of time, 30 to 20 to 30 minutes, then the ammonium nitrate um, can cause those kinds of explosions, and there was a lot of it present. And so this was their direct cause, this is what they said, due to evaporation of wetting agent. Um, and so you can read that, um, that, that started off those fires and uh, caused additional uh, containers of nitrocellulose to, to burn and fires to spread and start um, eventually going to the ammonium nitrate. So in the aftermath of the, the explosions, um, they found extensive violations of policies and procedures at that site, as you can imagine. Um, the, the temporary approvals for the operation facility to store and unpack hazardous goods had expired a long time before the incidents, um, but operations carried on and no extensions were ever applied for. Um, hazardous goods were constructed well before any permits, um, the hazardous goods area rather, um, was constructed well before any permits were applied for or, or ever approved. Uh, and when applications were made, um, the, the Rui Hai person in charge to order to get these things approved took all of the people there out to golf outings and to carry OP and to put them gifts and all kinds of things like that. That's the way business goes on. So you do it. It's, it was a case of who you knew and not meeting the criteria and how much, uh, you know, what, what boom, gifts boom. you gave and the Do you still have a job? Well, not all of them, no. According to the Chinese Port Operation Standard, ammonium nitrate is not allowed to be stored in that area at all. <laughs> it was only allowed to be loaded and unloaded, but not allowed to be stored there. There we go. Um, regulations stipulate that hazardous materials um, should not be mixed and stacked, um, but only, only stored um, in single levels in a particular outdoor area. Um, but instead, the Chinese loaded up five levels high in the containers. All of those materials. Um, as I mentioned before, tragically, when the firefighters arrived uh, to fight out the fire, there uh, they, uh, they they had no idea what they were going for. Uh, if they had been provided information about what was at that site, it really meant nothing. It was complete, uh, completely erroneous. So, if they had been told um, there was no ammonium nitrate, there's a little bit of this and a little bit of that, there were 40 times more. There were other things there that they were never told about. So they really didn't stand a chance. It was really, really unfair for those people and you know, all the families as well. Um, they had begun to fall back from the fire because they did realise that they were losing the battle to put out all of the fires. You, know, you can imagine with the LPG tank, the uh, storage tank area burning away, they, they had little chance to put that kind of a fire out. So they were backing away from that when those explosions happened. So that was still quite a few hundred metres away when those explosions went off. But that was just not enough. So this was the, another one of their statements there. Uh, 
class five oxidizing, uh, oxidizing substance and class six toxic substance, sodium cyanide, um, should only be put in an outdoor area. So in other words, that um, Tianjin Chemical Engineering Design Institute, um, they, they, they designed an area for these um, hazardous and toxic chemicals and goods to be stored, but they, they, everyone ignored that. Um, after the explosions, they went back and falsified their permits and records, <laughs> and they made it all legal to do what they had just done. So um, eventually, of course, they were caught out. There were 171 individuals named. These are people in the organizations uh, that had anything to do with this um, uh, incident were, were named in the, in the reports that came out and 10 organizations were named there. And, and I know from when I've been in China too, when they say named, that doesn't necessarily that they're alive anymore, or, you know, they'll be in jail now, or something like that. But not, not really, not necessarily alive. Um, there were government officials, um, including the likes of the Tianjin Work Safety Bureau. These are the people that were receiving a lot of the gifts to have authorized the permits that should never have been authorized, as well as the people that forged the permits after the event. 13 uh, personnel were arrested after the incident, including the chairman, vice chairman, general manager, finance school officer. Um, a lot of Communist Party officials ended up in jail as well. Um, and the government took over the whole site, but as you saw from some of those photos, it wasn't very long after that, they just shut it down. So lessons learned, um, these are some of the Chinese lessons learned there. But there were also some, some lessons that we went through too that I'll, I'll come to a little bit later on. So um, they were the lessons that they had learned before um, in different parts of the country after different types of events, not as dramatic as that, but um, other places where people have lost lives. A lot of um, contaminated food products, for instance, where I know one time, this is a thing you might notice on the Kiwi, a um, very famous story in New Zealand is with Frontera producing so much milk powder, and a lot of that was shipped to China. Um, and then that was doctored, or at least some of the Chinese companies took milk powder and added melamine to it, which is a, like a plastics material, to boost, um, to artificially boost some of the, uh, the, the reporting scores on its, um, uh, I forgot what the score was, but in any case it caused dozens and dozens of babies to die from um, gallbladder, uh, from, sorry, from um, gallstones. So this isn't something that is a unique thing in China, it's, it's something that you can read in the papers over there on a pretty regular basis. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole thing because it will take way too long. The, the major concerns, of course, when we got there, one initially was about this contamination testing, equipment damage. Um, there were a lot of sprinklers that had uh, activated because of the blast waves going on. And even as we got out to the likes of four to five kilometers there, we could find the roofs of entire buildings had jumped up about 50 centimeters and pushed down about 50 centimeters. So you can imagine what happened to sprinkler pipe work and air conditioning duct works. All of the intent, uh, these kind of suspended ceilings were all falling on the ground. Walls were pushed in on one side and pushed out on the other side, or, or sometimes both in or both out. Um, one type of building uh, material that seemed to do quite badly was the aluminium clad uh, foam insulated um, uh, cladding material used on cork stores and there's some very very big cork stores over there huge cork stores um, those panels don't bend at all and so when the blast wave hit those they just either cracked or fell off the walls they just they were just ripped right off the roofs so when you went up to the cork stores the, the walls were just falling on the ground like that right up to about two two and a half Sodium cyanide, um, it's a fairly toxic uh, chemical, of course. It, um, the, the more famous one is potassium cyanide, which is what they use for, uh, for the suicide pills during World War II. But sodium cyanide is just about as bad. Uh, it takes only about 200 to 300 milligrams to be fatal. And it's, a, it's an acute risk on that. And this is what I was talking about before, about dead bodies, that um, if you take a little bit every day, um, it's, not, it's not until you accumulate about 300 milligrams that you're going to fall over. It's only if you take it in one go or in a, in a short enough period. So if you take a tiny little bit every day, um, it's not going to cause you a problem. So, so, uh, so 
sodium cyanide is actually in like apricot seeds or apple seeds, and so you'd have to eat a few thousand apples probably before there's enough cyanide in there that's going to affect you. Um, some people can taste it or smell it. They, I don't recommend trying it. Um, it's supposed to taste like almonds a little bit, um, but I don't know for sure. And um, yeah, so it's, so it's very acute. And then when there's around about 300,000 kilos of this were unaccounted for, so there were about 600,000 kilos at that site before the explosions, there were about 300,000 kilos they found afterwards, and the rest had gone, but nobody knew where. And so that was uh, what caused a lot of the concern at all of the sites, downwind especially, about where did this stuff go, and is it safe to touch anything? And that part of the concern was, was really a big, a big issue. Um, when you have sodium, high, uh, sodium cyanide, um, if it becomes too hot, or particularly if it gets exposed to an acid, it gives off hydrogen cyanide, and that's something that you can find in, in sort of uh, more routine fires at a home, or a home you know, just domestic uh, arrangement of furniture and phones and other things burning. It's also very toxic and, and can kill you as well. Um, it's a colourless gas, um, or blue liquid, and um, once again, around about 300 milligrams per cubic metre uh, will be lit on in 10 to 60 minutes. So it depends on the dosage and how quick that you take that. This, this is what was also used in some of these um, death chambers during World War II in the likes of Dachau and other uh, concentration camps. You can see in the diamond over here, 442. Um, it's mostly the issue there is not so much about its flammability, it's more about its toxicity, so that um, normally that's a way bigger concern before you're ever worried about it burning or exploding or anything like that happening. Um, you might die of, of breathing it way before anything else happens. Um, this is just a guideline that we used when we were trying to get a good feel for you know, what, what level is okay or not okay. Um, and we were looking at the sodium, uh, sodium cyanide, which is kind of like a salt or a powder, rather than hydrogen cyanide. And hydrogen cyanide, especially about a week later, um, if it was there, it's sure blown away by then. Um, if there were still powders around, it's still exposed to acids that may generate it. But we were really on the lookout for the, the, the powder or the salts of sodium cyanide. And um, we had to come back to these kind of guidelines because there's very, very little information about what's enough or okay or not okay. But these guidelines were, were what we were guided by. Uh, this comes from the um, CDC, the Center of Disease Control in the US. And the key one that we were looking at here uh, mostly was 2.2 parts per million uh, within an eight hour period. Um, so if we, we used that, the, the lower end of the scale um, and, and kept it, if, there was, if we could find anything like that, then we were going to declare it as very toxic. The procedure we developed, uh, there wasn't actually a procedure we could find for measuring surface concentration. Yeah. And so if you swept it all up in one place and you had 300 milligrams in one spot, uh, that of course would be terrible. But the question was, well, how much on a surface area, if there was any, was too bad? And so we had to develop a procedure based on what was an acceptable level in liquids or in uh, the likes of hydrogen cyanide. Um, so we had to modify an existing test, but I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. That or not, but um, it, it's a test kit that's used often for detecting um, sodium cyanide in, in a solution. That's the kit there. Um, we had to come up with some formulas and demonstrate to others um, that it all made sense and, and uh, worked out the calculations there. And essentially, it can. It's a it's a wipe sample process that you have to then dissolve all of the salts or whatever is present. Um, then that has to be stabilised, that has to then be mixed with a reagent and compared in a vial to some other known levels of concentration in these other vials here. Um, that was always quite low. Um, we never had any bright blue colours, so we knew the concentrations were never too high. Um, then there's a lower scale, which is really down to 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 um, uh, milligrams per litre, I think it was. And once again, this sample that's in the photo here, it's a little bit hard to see, but it's pretty well clear. There's no blue tinge to it. And the lowest levels of this were, were clear as well. So we were down around point, uh, less than 0.1 level. Is that presumptive with the test? Well, in the beginning, we couldn't find anything anywhere. And yeah. so I wanted to prove the point. So I got some sodium cyanide. 
um, the problem with gold mine, and, and tested my method against some known um, solutions of sodium cyanide from the gold mine. And uh, the, the test method that we had calculated out or worked out like that proved to be exactly okay. So it was, in the beginning, quite theoretical. Um, and then after a couple of days, we were not finding anything and starting to doubt our own test method. So then we validated that as well. Uh, we probably should have validated it first, but we couldn't find a gold mine so fast. How many tests all up do you think you did? Probably a couple of hundred or more, wow. I suppose. Uh, actually, about double that because there were two parts of our process. And that, that's myself and my partner probably did about How long were we on the ground for? Three weeks. Wow. And then three weeks, a couple of weeks away, then another two weeks after that. And were the Chinese authorities interested in what you were doing? Were you... Well, they were. Um, yeah. Actually, what I can say that, that was interesting about that is that you know, we were very focused on our insured clients' sites. So that's what we were yeah. working around. And we had been advised, you know, that, and, and it's our normal practice anyway, is that our information and finance goes to our client, and then they can do whatever they like with it. But they keep it between them and their client. Um, there were other people on the ground there, and, and some of them were coming in from the likes of Greenpeace or, or other um, international independent investigators that were interested in what was going on. And so they made different findings, and some of them were a bit vague, and they would talk to people in, on the street, the public, and even talk to the um, Chinese media. They ended up in jail. Mm -hmm. So if you spoke to the media and you weren't authorised to do that, then you were put in jail. And so we avoided all of that. Um, but otherwise, if you had, then yeah, you, you'd be in a lot of trouble. Chinese didn't want that. And in fact, you know, I, I, I saw a lot of news articles over there, um, but Chinese, you know, through the, the Chinese um, great, big, what is it, the great firewall of China. So we only saw the, the filtered view, I don't, and I, I think you only saw the filtered view over here as well. And we don't really know what was being um, going on behind the scenes because if everything in, in China is Uh, there were other sites with strange things going on. This is a pretty simple one. It's just the roof of a building about three kilometres away. Um, this particular company manufactured tracks for um, very, very large diggers and the likes. And um, after the blast, they said the roof was corroding and things like that and, and had a lot of debris up there and corrosion. So another part of what we did was, was analyse what was going on. So um, we, we had a look at some of the dust up there. We didn't think it was sodium cyanide. It didn't seem to have that up with anything that we tested fluorides and other things uh, we, we do quite a lot of scanning electron microscope and um, EEX analysis to determine what's actually there um, and come to some various conclusions about that but I'll, I'll jump ahead a bit on the vehicle so after our first three weeks stint there and a couple of weeks away the vehicle insurers seemed to be very slow but then they asked us to go back and look at these vehicles as well some similar questions about contamination what can they do um, and so you can see there that, of course, these, these vehicles here where um, there's no visible damage. If you walk past the, the, all of those vehicles, there were no dents, no scratches. Um, they were just dusty from being in the Chinese environment for probably six months. Some of them have been there quite a long time. Long enough that the actual value of the vehicle is questionable. And then, of course, the ones on the right, there's nothing to talk about. They were destroyed. Just to give you an idea of the power of the explosion from around about 750 metres away, I just had to take this photo. And you can see there that you know, the building's been badly damaged, oh, um, the vehicles have all been badly damaged, but what do you think it would take for a piece of wood like that to go sideways through the bonnet without, without deflecting off? So what speed it would have to be hurtling along to just go straight through? And that was embedded into the, the console of the behind that. That's pretty extreme. What's the what? What? Uh, that might have been the. I don't know where that came from. But I was going to say it could have been the window seal, but they don't seal the one that they took off these days. Yeah, so I don't know what that is. It, it could have gone from far away. But there was one of a lot of interesting photos that I, I wandered around and took when I was there at different times. I thought it was just quite interesting. Um, but a lot of vehicles and um, 
what, what we did notice though, in some, some of these areas like this where we think the insurers would be a little bit thankful that not everything was destroyed, but when you walked around here, um, occasionally there'd be a, a vehicle with something that had landed on it and crushed it. Most of the vehicles were this far away, and this was around about three plus kilometres away. So there wasn't really any impact damage, or not even from blast wave damage. Um, but what we did find is that if you looked at the paintwork and the plastics, there's stains on the paintwork and the plastics, and that rendered a lot of the vehicles uneconomic to repair. So to try and repaint a brand new vehicle uh, was just going to cost too much from a manufacturer's point of view. Uh, actually, one of the other big issues that came up here, even though we were looking at Tesla and Porsche and, and uh, Range Rovers and all of these different types of vehicles, uh, one of the big questions came up well, who owns the vehicles? So the likes of Jeep or, or Range Rover, for instance, they didn't want any vehicles that have been involved in this explosion incident right up to that kind of five kilometre mark released into the market because they didn't want anyone later to say, I've got a problem with my vehicle, it came from this explosion, and, and these guys allow it to be sold and you know, they should compensate me and all those sorts of things. But they were powerless to order their vehicles to be crushed because they didn't own them anymore. That's what they wanted to be. They wanted to crush the whole 35,000 vehicles. But they belong to CATS, which is CATC, which is the China Automobile Trading Corporation. So all of the vehicles where they're put on the port, they're in a kind of a holding pen where they go through uh, clearance for customs and duties and the likes. Then they're owned by CATS, and then CATS controls the distribution throughout China. Uh, then they go back into the ownership of some of those corporates where they can sell them to their end users. But in that in-between time, it's not clear who owns the vehicles. And so they were stuck there for another six months while insurers and, and uh, CATS battled out who owns the vehicles and leave them to sign the disposition of the vehicles. So all these vehicles were from the local Chinese market, it wasn't part of the export market. The, these are all imported brand new vehicles for the local market, for the Chinese yeah. market, yeah. Oh. So make, most of them coming out of Europe. Um, and in China, they because they store everything outside, when these kinds of vehicles, the Jaguars and so on, uh, are delivered, they, have, they, they ship them over with a kind of a raincoat on them, if you like, to protect them from that kind of fallout. And, and that was just an interesting vehicle, I think. Um, but even though it was nice and shiny and new. Um, inside a selection of vehicles, sort of a sample selection, uh, we did a lot of analysis of uh, any particular kinds of gases. So this was including hydrogen cyanide, but also some PA, PCBs, PAH, and other compounds, um, toxic compounds, to see whether they existed or not. I didn't expect to find anything because it wasn't really anything to push gases into the vehicles in any kind of volume. Um, the impact blast would have hit it, and then any toxic chemicals or gases would come some minutes later, or even hours later, and by that time, there's no pressure wave to push them through an air filter or through a door seal. Is that using steam? Uh, this is using a small, <coughs> like a, a drager style pump, so it's, it's pulling in air through a, through a sampling mechanism, and the two, it, there's different uh, systems for detecting different or different types of chemicals and compounds. But on the other side, uh, that gives you an idea of the sort of damage that the building would sustain when even the vehicles didn't really get too badly damaged. These vehicles were in the same yard, actually. So the building there was pretty badly smashed up, um, and these vehicles were not really too badly affected. Uh, they're quite a streamlined shape, yeah. so the blast wave generally went over the top of them. What I do know is when you get a bit closer to them, though, um, on these kind of vehicles, if you looked at them, they would look nice and good, uh, fine from, from that kind of distance. And when you got close, you'd find ripples in the roof where the roof had been broken up or, or the, the blast wave um, had gone over the car, but the roof had moved. And uh, even if the roof hadn't moved, internal structures of the roof that are glued to the top skin of the roof have broken apart. Mm -hmm. So they would forever rattle and be weaker than they should be. So even those kinds of vehicles uh, that looked pretty good from the outside uh, were no longer in the new condition. I'll, I'll skip through a couple of these because it gets a bit boring. Just lots of vehicles here. Um, this vehicle, I've got a little yellow line around here. That shows just what I was talking about where um, these vehicles on this side this is around about two and a half or so kilometres away from the blast zone. Um, and everything looked fine, but when you started to look a little bit closer, you could see this 
uh, over here, just before the sunroof, a lot of the sunroof just popped right out. But if it didn't pop right out, you could see the metalwork had actually had a big thing in it. Every other part of the car was in a good condition, but essentially destroyed from that point of view. Um, and that, that dent I could find on every single car in that yard, there were probably about 500 cars in that yard. Uh, they weren't in it. In that yard, there were beds and jeeps and The debris that landed on the cars, uh, even out to around about two and a half kilometers, um, sometimes it was as, as big as like a 44 gallon drum, um, had, had just landed on some vehicles and just completely flat on them. I don't know how, from how high they came, but very, very high. This is just a photo of some stains on the plastics that uh, very, very far away from the blast zone. Um, and, and this is one of the disappointing things uh, for the insurers that uh, we always say to the insurers, you know, when something happens, call us straight away, we can save a lot of money. But immediately after the blast, all that had to be done here was just give the car a wash and that was it. Just put it through a car wash, job was finished. But they waited about four months. After that time, the car's was great. <coughs> Nothing happened to it, just that some chemicals had sat there for long enough to eat through, stain the plastic, stain the paint. You couldn't do anything with it anymore. That was finished just because they didn't make a phone call. We see that quite a lot actually on all kinds of claims and different scenarios. Uh, so we went through all of that and um, other kinds of chemicals and, and, and toxics that uh, we were testing for there. Um, I won't go into any details on these. Asbestos was a concern. Uh, turned out to be not really much of a concern. There's, there's plenty of it in China around about the place. I think there's more in Australia actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was a lot of misinformation, mm -hmm. and this is something that may have been on the news headlines here. I don't know. Um, after after this explosion, there was a vacuum of any information, and nobody knew what was going on. And, and, and I've mentioned the name one of the stories that they had spread is that put this, this all of this dead fish washing up in the rivers, just down the way a little bit. And um, you know, there's, there's got to be one of these toxic chemicals around, so someone's got to find out, someone's got to do something. Um, but actually, that wasn't the case at all. Um, these fish, nobody really knows where they came from, but they don't even live in those waters. They come from far offshore. So probably dumped out of a fishing boat or something like that. Any tests on the fish came up negative, they, they were dead, but they were really was a, an issue about um, the quality of information and, and this came back to us having to be very careful about what to believe and do a lot of our own testing and, and have a good amount of faith in what we were doing ourselves but also quite a lot of caution. Um, every day we went back to Tianjin City 40 kilometres away and we were in a hotel um, probably this kind of room full of experts um, and other people doing some of the things for different clients from around the world and we would share information with each other you know if we found anything where have you been what have you done what have you seen so that was a good forum for us to get educated about what was going on as well. Um, drone photography became quite important um, to, to see what was going on over the other side of the fence. And uh, the Chinese were using it as well to work out the sizes of the craters and other things going on there. So have you allowed, <coughs> allowed you to fly drones in China? I don't know. So um, that's false photography. Yeah, there, there's quite a lot of drone footage on YouTube, for instance, yeah. um, we didn't fly any drones ourselves, but um, they, they were there and they were above quite a lot of those sites. Like a lot of the vehicle, um, vehicle yards, there's drone footage of a lot of those so <coughs> up like 100 meters or something like that and scanning around, having a look at how extensive that damage was. Um, quite a lot of people, um, ourselves included at the beginning, uh, had hydrogen cyanide sniffers that we were wearing mentioned before, some insured parties react quickly and some don't. That makes a big difference. I, I would say in the, in, the, in the case of the vehicle insurers not calling us within a couple of weeks as opposed to about four months later, um, that probably lost in the, in the order of about 15,000 brand new vehicles. It's 
quite a lot of money involved there. I had a much, much bigger loss than that um, in India from a flood through the same mechanism where they had a flood. They didn't do anything for two months. Um, there were about $150 million worth of goods and containers that had filled up with water, fresh water that wasn't really a problem, but then they didn't do anything. They didn't open anything up. They just left the water in the containers. After two months, we went along, opened it up. But then it's only a case of counting up how big is the problem rather than trying to figure out what could be saved anymore. Yeah, I think that's about it. There's plenty of stuff online if you want to learn more, plenty of YouTube clips and other things. <laughs> and that's, that's how I, that's actually myself, I think. But that, that was how we felt on the first day of walking on the site. So we didn't stay. <laughs> But actually, they're all burnt, so there's nothing more to talk about on those. Uh, anyway, so that's the presentation. Does anyone have any other questions? I think we've been through a few of them along the way. Anything new? No? Okay. Very good. Thank you. So, what lessons have you learned? Well, besides um, recalling earlier. A, a, one of the major lessons is one that I repeat to our clients, which are the insurers all the time, is that you have to go fast in these situations. You can't wait around. Um, and we're mainly involved in um, assessing, for instance, here, we weren't involved in looking at the cause or trying to investigate the origin or the cause. We were looking at the extent of damage, what can be saved. And so for our clients, it's always a, it's always a times of the essence. That, like I mentioned on the, on the India job after a flood, and same here after an explosion. Um, that time makes a big difference to how much you might save, and it can make a difference of sort of 95% of the value involved. Um, in terms of that incident itself, um, I've found pretty much all of the explosions are quite unique. And uh, on this particular one, uh, we found that we had to be pretty quick to work out a way to work out the, the methods to analyze for uh, cyanides. Um, and so that we've got that packed away, and so if something came up like that again in the future, then we're ready to go. I've got plenty of cyanide in my office right now. I can go test for that. Um, and if it was something else, then we, you know, we had to sort of think about some other types of compounds as well. We didn't end up testing in a lot of detail for those because other people had test methods already and available. Um, but we had to educate ourselves on those. Um, at the end, we relied on other people for those, uh, that information. Um, but if something similar happened again in Sydney, for instance, then we'd be ready to react to that. So you, you have taken the country a massive amount of equipment in terms of testing? Or? Yes, and, and a, a lesson I've learned a long time before that is not necessarily to disclose everything. Oh, okay. If you've got cyanide in your luggage. Oh, you see it, that's a, <laughs> no. Um, but yeah, you do have to take a fair amount of equipment um, and, you, and you've got to take a fair amount of PPE with you as well. But, you know, you can get anything in China, of mm. course. Um, so that part's not too hard to overcome anything over there too. Where do they keep the, the remaining cyanide from? Uh, yes, so the missing cyanide, um, the conclusion was, or the, or the um, general agreement was that um, it, it actually breaks down under heat and pressure, and, and the general consensus was that it had broken down during those explosions and fires um, and converted even to hydrogen cyanide and some other inert or, or, or not toxic substance and have been blasted up into the environment, the atmosphere, and then they've blown away. So get down to the exact chain of events, you know, what, what, what they suspect initially? Uh, only as much as what was on the screen here, um, nitro has been the, um, the starting point of the whole chain of reactions, um, the major explosions being the The, um, the, the immediately after that explosion, so I think about two days after then, before we arrived, apparently there was extremely heavy rain as well as high, high temperatures as well. That would have also taken care of a lot of that sodium cyanide because it breaks down under heat and also um, will break down within the water. Um, Whereabouts was the nitrocellulose made if it was being shipped in there? I don't know. Mm. All right. Any more questions? Thank you, Brian. Here's a little gift. Hope you like red wine. Sure do. Thank you. And you also get a great New South Wales AFI shirt. If you want one, you can get our website. Or we have some here. So thank you very nice. much.
It was uh, very interesting. You obviously observed a very unique event, uh, which really we don't really get to see. Uh, yeah, something thank God in event. this country. Yeah, yeah. And let's hope we don't see something like that. But I'm sure our regulations are a little bit tighter than, <laughs> <laughs> than others. But uh, very, very good presentation. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you everyone for Thank attending. Uh, for those on the website or watching this, uh, certainly look at our uh, upcoming education night. The next one will be in October at the Academy, the new Fire Rescue Academy at Orchard Hills in the first Thursday of October, whatever Thursday date that is. And uh, if you're interested in the Ross Brogan Scholarship, also please uh, look at our website to apply. Applications close at the end of this month, end of August. Uh, thank you for attending. Turn that off.